A charismatic leader, one who has risen above all others, speaks to the multitudes. They have waited for him. They believe in him. They expect he will heal the world's ills. Some say he is the Messiah, finally returned. But this man is not a savior. He is the king of terror who will usher in the end of everything. For thousands of years, prophets around the world have predicted the end of days. More than one suggests the apocalypse is fast approaching. We call this theoretical convergence between doomsday prophecies and today's events the Nostradamus effect. How the end begin. The Antichrist, the false messiah, a child of Satan. The word Antichrist first appears in the New Testament. In this ancient text, there is a prophecy that states the Antichrist, the beast, will come to seduce mankind. Instead, believers say he will usher in the end of days, Armageddon. The Antichrist is a man who receives the power of Satan. The Antichrist, of course, represents the devil on earth. He is a false messiah. That's exactly what he is. We will examine the theory that the Antichrist is already among us. Who is the Antichrist? Who predicted his arrival? If prophecies are to be believed, do they connect to more than one warning about such a figure? And are they linked to events in our own time in a web of convergence? We will neither refute nor endorse these theories, merely present the evidence. The word antichrist has its origins in religion, combining the Greek anti, instead of or in place of, with Christ or Christos, the anointed. What it refers to is a period in the early church when various groups were starting to split off, each of them understanding Christ's teachings in their own unique way, and each of them denouncing all the others as heretical. So from the point of view of any one of these groups, everybody else was an antichrist. Other religions have their own malevolent figures, but only the religions in the Judaic tradition have an antichrist. The term Antichrist is literally only alluded to really in Islam besides Judaism and Christianity. And they have their imposter messiah. And he will come on the scene in the last days, much like the Antichrist in the Bible will come on the scene in the last days. In Islam, he is called Masi ad-Dajjal, or the imposter. Some biblical interpreters believe that just as Jesus is the Son of God, the Antichrist is considered the son of Satan. In spirituality, the enemy of Christ himself is the Antichrist. Even as God the Father sent Jesus Christ the Son, theoretically, Satan himself will send this man on the planet to be the enemy of all that is good. One of the earliest of the biblical antichrist prophecies comes from the New Testament in the book of Revelation. It describes the antichrist's arrival in the world. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. How is this ancient prophecy entwined with other, later prophecies about the Antichrist? Prophecies that may be an example of the Nostradamus effect. For some, the key may lie with Nostradamus himself. Nostradamus was a messenger of the divine plan. He would have been interested in the Antichrist because he would want the human race to know what they were facing in the future, specifically toward the end times. 
Nostradamus began publishing all of his prophecies, including his visions of the Antichrist, in the mid-16th century. Nostradamus straddled this really obscure line between magic and science, between heresy and conformity. His prophecies consist of 10 books called Centuries, each consisting of four-lined poems called quatrains. It was within these writings that Nostradamus revealed his visions of the Antichrist. Nostradamus categorically believed that his gift of prophecy was a gift from God. It was his responsibility to alert the world to these things. Some suggest that the visions he experienced were horrible and confusing, a mix of unrecognizable technology and staggering violence. Try to imagine what it would be like if you had an ability to open a window to 500 years ahead into the future and you saw fantastic things that went against everything you believed, what would you do with that? He attempted to describe them in his writings. One who the infernal gods of Hannibal will cause to be reborn, terror to all mankind. Nostradamus dedicated a number of quatrains to Antichrist prophecy. Followers of his quatrains confirmed that Nostradamus did not see just one Antichrist. He saw three Antichrists, each appearing in his own time, each worse than the last. Nostradamus is unique in the history of prophecy. All other traditions, East and West, have one Antichrist, but he has three. Experts say Nostradamus wrote of two Antichrists that have since come and gone, leaving unparalleled destruction and bloodshed in their wake. Many insist that the final part of this prophecy has yet to come true. They suggest that the third false prophet may be destined to wreak havoc in our own time, and that he may be among us right now. Some believe that the key to unlocking the mystery of the third Antichrist may be found in the identities of the first two, and that clues revealing who they are could be found in Nostradamus's quatrains. An emperor will be born near Italy. He will cost his empire very dearly. In this quatrain, it is suggested that Nostradamus prophesied the first Antichrist. Nostradamus predicts this destructive leader will come from southern Europe to plague his own people. Napoleon was born near Italy. He did bring his empire to ruin. In that quatrain, we have a story of a ruler who brought about disaster. Is Napoleon the leader Nostradamus envisioned? Century one, quatrain 60, would seem to be a pretty good dead-on prediction as close as Nostradamus comes to an identifiable prophecy which came true in a way that we can recognize. The second Antichrist is even worse. Nostradamus writes that he too is European and possesses unprecedented powers of persuasion. From the very depths of the west of Europe, a young child will be born of poor people. He who by his tongue will seduce a great troop. Hitler was famous for his oratory, for leading a nation astray with his oratorical gift. Once again, Nostradamus's prophecy seems to converge with an actual historical figure, one born centuries later, a man who very nearly conquered the world. Many believe that if Nostradamus successfully predicted the appearance of Napoleon and Hitler, his prophecy of the third Antichrist is also likely to come true. Is this exaggerated doctrine or credible evidence? What are the exact links between these three alleged false prophets? A closer examination of Nostradamus's Antichrist quatrains may allow us to reveal the truth. Nearly 500 years ago, history's famed prophet Nostradamus predicted the arrival of three antichrists, each building on the power of the last. Some believe the third and most dangerous antichrist may be among us now. 
things tend to go in threes. In the esoteric world, we call it the law of threes. So the basic idea was that there would be three people that would together, if you looked at the broad range of their history, completely change civilization. Will an investigation of various threads of evidence help us judge the accuracy of the belief that the third Antichrist will appear in our lifetime? Most people already are looking for somebody to lead the world to a global peace, to solve these great crises that we have throughout the world. The Antichrist will be that savior. What clues are embedded in the quatrains of Nostradamus? Hints to help us identify the third and worst Antichrist. He warned. At once, one will see vengeance, 100 powers, thirst, famine. Some suggest that this is a vision Nostradamus had of our current time, and that it proves the Antichrist is in our midst. In using the word vengeance, is he pointing to our current wars in Iraq, Afghanistan, the Far East, in our own inner cities? Could the seer's reference to thirst and famine describe the starvation that exists today in drought and poverty-stricken villages? Nostradamus's genius may not have been as a seer or a prophet, but as a surrealist poet. His verses are broken, they're hard to understand, and they seem to speak to certain levels of the human mind that aren't always that easy to approach. 1555, Provence, France. Nostradamus sits in his secluded study. He appears to embark on a psychic journey in search of answers. He hears a voice at a certain point, and suddenly there's a shaking through his robes. And then a terror, followed by a divine splendor. And then he hears the god speak. Is Nostradamus really seeing the future? Evidence suggests Nostradamus identified the first Antichrist in one especially cryptic quatrain. Paul? Nay, Oleron will be more of fire than blood. Many believe this is Nostradamus's first Antichrist prophecy. He wrote it in 1555. Paul, Nay, Oleron are three towns in southwest France. The fact that the first three words are in bold font, uppercase. It's like nudge, nudge, nudge. I'm saying something here that you should look a second time at. For those who see prophecy in his work, Nostradamus is trying in this quatrain to reveal the identity of the first Antichrist by placing him in France. When you rearrange the letters of these three small towns, they spell out Napoleon Roy, Napoleon the King. The Wa spelled R-O-Y in the old French for R-O-I. Napoleon Bonaparte, one of history's most notorious tyrants. Is this quatrain proof that the Emperor of France was the first Antichrist prophesied? Did Nostradamus see Napoleon's arrival on the world stage 233 years before he came to power? An emperor will be born near Italy. He will cost his empire very dearly. Born in Corsica, about 30 miles from Italy, Napoleon proclaimed himself Emperor of France in 1799. He presented himself as a champion and savior of his people. Historians see Napoleon as a hero, a savior of France, during a time that France was economically suppressed, during a time when France needed a savior. He came as a false messiah, one who dominated the entire population and even crowned himself. People that follow him create evil. In other words, he influences people. According to Nostradamus, the ability to appear as a savior and seduce entire populations is characteristic of the Antichrist. But for interpreters of the prophecies, additional clues point to Napoleon as the first Antichrist. 
including Nostradamus's veiled warning to a Catholic pope of approaching danger. Roman pontiff, beware of approaching. Out of the city which the two rivers water, in that place you will come to spit your blood. In fact, Napoleon held Pope Pius VI prisoner in the town of Valence, where he later died vomiting blood in the month of August. Valence can be found at the confluence of two rivers. Followers of the famed seer say even Napoleon's contemporaries saw the likeness of the emperor in the writings of Nostradamus. Various prophecies in Nostradamus's verses were even applied to him in Napoleon's own time. One, for example, bearing a name which no French king passed on to him. That is to say, no one else was named Napoleon in the French monarchy, and he wasn't part of the old Bourbon ruling family. More fearsome than a thunderbolt, tremble Italy, Spain, and England, all of whom Napoleon either invaded or fought with. So this kind of prophecy has been very easily applied to Napoleon. But it is believed that perhaps the level of havoc and bloodshed committed in Napoleon's name has most aptly branded him Antichrist. Nostradamus seems clear that the supposed first Antichrist, too, will be soaked in blood. That he is less a prince than a butcher. Certainly, Napoleon was responsible for the deaths of many people. When he invaded Russia in 1812, his army, starting out, was 600,000 men. When he went back defeated, it was 18,000. He is the first Antichrist because one of the things they all share is a great shedding of blood. And that was the first big modern shedding of blood from Napoleon. Responsible one way or another for three and a half million deaths, likely more than any other single human being before him, many conclude that Napoleon does fit the description of the first Antichrist. The quatrains further state, but the French nation will fear the hour, north wind, the army having pushed too far. Even his wintry defeat after pushing too far into Russia, the north wind, seems to be echoed in Nostradamus's quatrains. Did Napoleon himself believe he was the first antichrist Nostradamus prophesied? Evidence suggests the emperor was drawn to his writings. Napoleon traveled with a collection of Nostradamus' prophecies on his bedside table. Unfortunately, they were forgeries. At the turn of the 19th century, Napoleon ordered a genocide in France's colony in Haiti. His troops slaughtered as many as 100,000 slaves, gassing some of them with sulfur dioxide in the holds of French ships. A preview of genocide to come? Experts on Nostradamus' Antichrist prophecy believe Napoleon's actions created the conditions for a second and third Antichrist to follow, each who would ravage mankind, just as Nostradamus prophesied. If you did not have a Napoleon Bonaparte, you would not have had the steps which would have led to a unification of Germany later in the 19th century, which led to the second Antichrist, which created the modern world that created the atmosphere for the oncoming and third and final Antichrist. There is no doubt that Napoleon's trail of misery and destruction marks him as one of history's monsters. And if prophecy is to be believed, he is more. Perhaps the first Antichrist foretold by Nostradamus. Are there really multiple links between Nostradamus and Napoleon Bonaparte? And are they more than coincidence? How strong is the connection between Napoleon and our second alleged Antichrist, Adolf Hitler? Is it possible that these connections will lead us to identify the third Antichrist? If the Nostradamus effect is true, have the warnings in ancient texts and prophecies from Nostradamus himself converged to suggest that the end of days has actually begun? What, if any, would be the signs of Armageddon? I will take the Israelites out of the nations where they have gone. I will gather them from all around and bring them back into their own land. God said throughout the Old Testament that in the last days, 
I will draw my people from the four corners of the earth back to the land of their forefathers, Palestine. That literally opened the curtain for the Antichrist to come on the scene. We are examining whether an Antichrist of biblical proportions has arrived to accelerate the chaos and destruction witnessed in the modern world. The quatrains of Nostradamus suggest that this Antichrist will be the last of three false messiahs. His arrival will be immediately preceded by a second evil, one who creates the conditions for the last of Nostradamus's Antichrists to destroy the world. For centuries, followers of Nostradamus have examined his quatrains for clues to the identity of the second Antichrist. From the very depths of the west of Europe. Nostradamus feared that the second Antichrist would be many times more brutal than the first. Nostradamus is telling us that something is coming upon the earth that we are not used to, that he has described, if you like, in the first two Antichrists. They weren't simply national monsters. They were supranational monsters. They had enormous worldwide influence. And I think that that's what he's implying here. His prophecies about the second Antichrist are among his most persistent and specific. Many agree they point directly at history's most notorious madman. He who by his tongue will seduce a great troop. Nostradamus first mentions the second Antichrist in this chilling quatrain, which dooms Europe to another round of terror and destruction. And there is just such a man from the exact location prophesied by Nostradamus, Adolf Hitler. Liberty will not be regained. It will be occupied by a black, proud, villainous, and unjust man. When the matter of the pontiff is opened, the Republic of Venice will be vexed by Dister. Hitler often appears in interpretations of Nostradamus largely because Nostradamus keeps referring to a figure called Hister, which is fairly close to Hitler, and it means the Danube. Here, Nostradamus's prophecy seems precisely on target. Hitler was born in Austria, and Austria's main river is the Danube. It didn't take people long in Hitler's time to start applying them to him. Moreover, Magda Goebbels, who is the wife of Hitler's propaganda minister, Joseph Goebbels, who was interested in the occult, came across these things and said, wow, this must be about Hitler. She wasn't alone. Others made this same connection. The typesetter in one of the early versions of the prophecies actually turned one of the Hister Ister quatrains into Hitler by mistaking the letter and substituting the T. Hitler was known for his mesmerizing and charismatic speeches. In less than 10 years, he seduced Germany into waging war across the globe with virtually unquestioned impunity. Most disturbing, he convinced Germans to carry out a genocide that virtually wiped out European Jews and other victims. In all, more than six million people. Nostradamus writes, his fame will increase towards the realm of the East the last line is quite interesting, which also points to it being about Hitler. Imperial Japan became so enamored with Adolf Hitler that it led to the Tripartite Act, the Axis Alliance, which united Mussolini's Rome with Hitler's Third Reich and Imperial Japan. Responsible for a death toll that reached into the tens of millions, Hitler is synonymous with evil more than any other single human being in history. But could he also be Nostradamus's second Antichrist? The way to understand why Hitler is the second Antichrist is again the steps that the first Antichrist initiates Napoleon by creating the modern world through the Napoleonic Wars that created the unification of Germany, the Second Reich, which led to the creation of the Third Reich of Adolf Hitler. That's the link between the first and the second. It is suggested that, like Napoleon before him, Hitler may have been aware of his own destiny as an Antichrist, as revealed in the quatrains of Nostradamus. 
Hitler was part of an esoteric and occult underworld before the First World War that was fascinated by Nostradamus and his prophecies. By 1939, Hitler was self-identifying with the idea of being the second Antichrist. Since this was such a large conflict, since this was another one of Nostradamus's very meaningful time periods, then this must be the second of his three Antichrists. They also believe Hitler perhaps saw Napoleon as his Antichrist predecessor. He revered Napoleon, and soon after the fall of France in 1940, visited the French dictator's tomb. And even more verses seem to link Hitler to Nostradamus's second Antichrist. He seems to hint at Hitler's downfall. Beast ferocious with hunger will cross the rivers. The greater part of the battlefield will be against Hister. If you were in the 16th century and you had to describe an automobile or a tank, or a floating attack boat. You might call it a beast that roared with its thundering engines, that breathed like a dragon, that come across the great rivers. Beast ferocious with hunger. He's trying to look at fantastic technology that he's never seen before. Into a cage of iron will the great one be drawn when the child of Germany observes nothing. And the cage of iron, is this Hitler's bunker? the bunker that Hitler retreated to toward the end of this reign. If an emissary of future visions gave you a great trench dug in Berlin that had all this amazing iron rebar work for a huge bunker that was under construction, wouldn't it be said that you put that man underground into this great cage, which became the Fuhrer bunker? It was in this bunker that Hitler, on the verge of losing the war he himself initiated, committed suicide. Some see Hitler's sociopathic lack of conscience as further proof that he is Nostradamus' second antichrist. If Christ embodies pure compassion, Hitler is his exact opposite. I am haunted by a quote that Hitler gave very honestly about his ability to find the right way and make the right decision. I follow my path with the complete confidence and certainty of a sleepwalker. To be asleep is the ultimate unconsciousness, to literally be a somnambulist through life. Here is this very powerful, charismatic sleepwalker leading the whole world into an abyss. That, to me, is Antichrist. According to believers, the Nostradamus effect may be overwhelming our modern world. But how can these theories be tested? If Napoleon was the first Antichrist and Hitler the second, who was the third? And is he among us? Evidence suggests that before this false prophet can unleash a terrible battle between the forces of good and evil, another critical step must first take place. The prophecies of Nostradamus suggest that a third false messiah, a new antichrist, may arrive in our lifetime. Some believe his predictions are foreshadowed by the book of Revelation. This biblical text purports that a so-called savior will set the conditions for Armageddon. From where do believers suspect this third Antichrist will emerge? Will it be in the turbulent Middle East, Iraq, Iran? Or might he appear from desperate regions within Africa? Some say he will perhaps emerge from within a superpower government, such as the United States. I believe that the world is already preparing for him coming on the scene. What clues in the quatrains of Nostradamus provide solid leads to identify the third Antichrist? The one he wanted to warn our time about was the third one, because he was the worst of all of them, because he would learn from the mistakes made by Hitler. This way, he would know which way to go. And he's a very dangerous man, very powerful and very dangerous. But there's a strange and unexpected twist 
Some believe this most horrible of Nostradamus' antichrists will be heralded by evil forerunners, extremely dangerous men who will signal his arrival. Nostradamus seems to suggest as much in this obscure quatrain. The chief of London through the realm of America, the Isle of Scotland will be tried by frost. King and Reb will face an antichrist so false that he will place them in the conflict altogether. Are the followers of Nostradamus suggesting that some of today's most savage leaders who have targeted the United States and Western Europe with their terrorist attacks may be trusty lieutenants of this third antichrist? Are they actually clearing the way for the third antichrist's arrival? He saw at least seven rulers that would come to power before the time of the antichrist. Some believe Saddam Hussein was one of these forerunners. They say it was written in the stars and interpreted by Nostradamus himself, who predicted, At once one will see vengeance, 100 powers, thirst, famine, when the comet will pass. Saddam Hussein died and was hung. And on that very night before his death, a little smudge in the sky called Comet McNaught became visible. Comet McNaught in the next two weeks became the brightest comet in 60 years. Although Nostradamus experts suggest Saddam himself was the third Antichrist, others disagree. They argue that unlike Napoleon and Hitler, as the supposed first two Antichrists, Hussein lacked their vast power. Before you can qualify really to be the third Antichrist, you've got to have a big army, you've got to have a big air force, you've got to have a big navy, you've got to have a lot of manpower, you've got to have a lot of economic resources. Saddam had a little of that, but not a whole lot of it. So he didn't really qualify to be the big bad wolf of the future. He saw Saddam Hussein as not the Antichrist, but a forerunner. Many of these would set the stage. Others suggest yet another quatrain as possible proof that the theory of forerunners to the third Antichrist is valid. It seems to implicate Osama bin Laden, mastermind of the attacks on 9-11. In the year 1999 and seven months, a great king of terror will come from the sky. We had the famous prophecy about the king of terror descending from the skies in 1999, which could be a reverse code for 1999 becomes 9111, September month. Great king of terror coming from the sky, hijacked planes. Other followers of end of day prophecy have echoed the belief that bin Laden is the third antichrist. But is he really? At first I thought Osama bin Laden he might qualify to be the third Antichrist, but it's a little bit too early to tell. Well, as time has gone on, I think we were jumping the gun to think that either Saddam or bin Laden was Nostradamus' third Antichrist. Further examination of yet another quatrain focuses the emphasis back on the third Antichrist described by Nostradamus. Long awaited, he will never return in Europe he will appear in Asia. So Antichrist can pop up in any country, and we don't know if he's going to be from the Middle East. He might be from China. We don't know. He says that he will rise above all the kings in the Orient. The Ayatollah Khomeini, Muammar Gaddafi, Kim Jong-il, with so many possible forerunners having come from the Middle and Far East, some interpreters believe it is no coincidence that the search for the Antichrist is now focused in such unstable regions. In the Middle East, some faithful see the return of the Jewish people to Israel as further fulfillment of biblical prophecy, and further evidence the end times and the Antichrist are here today. Primarily in 1917, Britain took control of Palestine. In the Balfour Declaration, they invited Jews from all over the world back to Israel. That began, in some Bible scholars' opinion, the last days as we know it today. For other scholars, 
This hunt for the Antichrist conveniently pits one religion against another. It's so interesting that we as humans love to have an enemy. And throughout the ages, we have always wanted to focus either on a whole people group, on a society that we can have as our enemy. But what does Nostradamus say? If the evil forerunners to the third Antichrist have come and gone, what happens now? The enduring mystery of his quatrains has allowed multiple interpretations over the centuries on the details of the third Antichrist's appearance. Who do his followers actually believe may be this third and final false savior? As I read through some of these time period predictions of Nostradamus, some of these shifts, is that he's presenting us with alternative future paths. If we make a choice in this decade, then it's gonna result in these events further down the line. If we respond to those events negatively, then this is gonna happen. If we respond positively, then maybe we can change things. Today, believers see signs everywhere of global destruction. To them, this may confirm that the third Antichrist is among us. If we accept these theories as fact, who is he finally? And how far along is he in his timeline of destruction? Is the clock ticking? Is doomsday fast approaching? There are those who believe the Nostradamus effect is occurring as ancient prophecies and today's cataclysmic events converge. Some say this course is irrevocable. If it were up to human will, if it were a human will choice, we could change this and not have to go through it. We don't have that choice. Biblical prophecy warns of an antichrist who will destroy mankind. Nostradamus says we will suffer three. If we accept the theory that Napoleon and Hitler were the first two, what might the third and most cunning antichrist hold in store for us? Could the Antichrist be a real person and not a construct of religion and symbolism? We are racing irreversibly toward the end of time and through the ultimate prophecies that condemn the earth. It is prophecy and prophecy will be fulfilled to the letter. Nostradamus's prophecies suggest the third Antichrist may have powers that far exceed the other two. Stained with mass murder and adultery, this great enemy of humanity will be worse than any man before him, in steel, fire, water, bloody and monstrous. So the question becomes, are any real leaders today actual candidates who meet the criteria identified in these prophecies? Critics point out that just about every world leader has been accused of fitting the profile of Antichrist at one time or another according to who is or is not popular at any given time. This individual changes with the generations, practically with the decades. In the 1970s, it was common, or at least done, to identify possibly someone like Henry Kissinger. And the list of unlikely candidates goes on. Still, some cite a mysterious name, Mabus. It appears in another one of Nostradamus's quatrains. Mabus will soon die, then will come, a horrible undoing of people and animals. Some believe Mabus is the name Nostradamus has assigned to the third Antichrist. Could Mabus be a coded reference? Two presidents have been linked to the name Mabus by extreme adherents of prophecy. The first is the 43rd president of the United States, George W. Bush. Even non-believers of this theory can explain the connection. You follow the rule of everything in lowercase letters. The GW becomes AM because you can turn them upside down. Swivel them, and you have Ma Bush. Drop the redundant letter, you have Ma Bush. Although this seems to implicate George W. Bush as a candidate for the third Antichrist, Scholars dismiss that suggestion, especially since his transition out of power is credited as being orderly. But what about President number 44? 
More recently, there was a mayor in Georgia who got into trouble for circulating an email asking if Barack Obama was the Antichrist. So the Antichrist is a very fluid concept that can adapt to your needs. In fact, Nostradamus himself seems to definitively say that no recent U.S. president fits the bill. The third Antichrist very soon annihilated. 27 years his bloody war will last. This prophecy suggests a long-lasting worldwide war will follow the third Antichrist's death. Could the third Antichrist have already come and gone? The Bible points to a series of cataclysms that may coincide with the aftermath of the third Antichrist. The book of Revelation states, There was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth made of hair, and the whole moon became like blood, and the stars fell from the sky to the earth. Many say the natural and unnatural disasters that now plague the earth indicate we are at a tipping point. But are we really closer to the end than ever before? The prophets are trying to tell us about climate change, about famine, about a figure in the Middle East that we need to recognize before he starts a 27-year war. These are the things that the prophets like Nostradamus are trying to make us see and change. If we accept the theories by adherents of prophecy that we may be on the path to Armageddon, might we have time to influence those events? Are the multiple quatrains of Nostradamus hard evidence that the third Antichrist is among us? The final line he talks about, one of the ugliest visions that I've ever seen. The heretics dead, captives exiled, blood-soaked human bodies. Is he talking about hemorrhagic fever when he talks about blood-soaked human bodies, which is also something that certain biological agents do. And a reddened, icy hail covering the Earth. Does he mean a reddened, icy hail from some kind of nuclear discharge that creates a modest nuclear winter? Little rain, warm wind, wars, incursions. The pestilences, those kinds of things are just getting closer together, and then they're escalating. A horrible undoing of people and animals. I think Nostradamus in his prophecies often shows a fascination and a horror. He uses the word horrible a lot in looking at the more negative possibilities of the future. It is fact that multiple crises worldwide have deepened. Nuclear weapons among rogue nations have increased tenfold. Economies around the world remain on the brink of collapse. The U.S. government prepares for another terrorist attack on American soil. More coincidence? For believers, these are not random events, but dire signs of the coming apocalypse. We're seeing the mass deterioration of our Earth and its environment. As that sea level starts to raise up, and countries start to be flooded, that's when the mass panic is gonna hit. It's going to come upon us so quick that people will be panicked. We're talking about complete universal destruction where nobody can help anybody. But others suggest the prophecies of Nostradamus have a decidedly different meaning and purpose. I think people need comfort. They want to know what's going to happen, especially at times of great unease, such as we're experiencing at the moment. And Nostradamus appears to offer some sort of certainty in the sense that so many of his quatrains have been seen to be correct in retrospect. As the theory goes, the end fast approaches, the sands slip away, and the hands spin out of control. The third Antichrist wreaks havoc. Is this our future? Perhaps Nostradamus is warning us that people must pay attention and act. We've been here before. We're going through it now, we'll go through it in the future. But humanity will go on. But many interpreters say we won't, that it's only a question of when the third Antichrist will make his demonic entrance. If we accept the premise that the Bible and Nostradamus are warning us, 
what messages remain for us to decode? Or are we ultimately destined to experience the Nostradamus effect? December 21st, 2012. Welcome to the last day on Earth. Disaster has descended from the sky and the Earth is shaken to its core. The oceans consume our shores and beyond. All modern technology fails. The world has shut down. For thousands of years, prophets around the world have predicted the end of days. More than one suggests the apocalypse is fast approaching. We call this theoretical convergence between doomsday prophecies and today's events the Nostradamus effect. It is a date that has become synonymous with the end. December 21st, 2012. Why do so many people believe that on that day, the world will experience an unprecedented cataclysm? Modern researchers point to unusual correlations across diverse cultures, all of which seem to predict that 2012 may be the year when we meet our demise. We're heading towards the seminal event. The greatest crisis in human history is upon us. The Earth is going to be tried by fire. We are getting closer and closer with the escalation in the numbers of tornadoes, the numbers of hurricanes, the numbers of just floods, pestilence, the fact that we have our oceans dying out. We will examine the prophecies that point to 2012 as the year the world will be annihilated. These prophecies seem to connect ancient cultures, such as the Maya and the Hopi, the Hindu and ancient China. Even modern science and the insights of computer experts linked to Nostradamus himself to suggest a doomsday convergence in 2012. We will neither refute nor endorse these theories, merely present the evidence. To some, a comparison of apocalyptic prophecies for 2012 yields unusual correlations. Researchers began comparing notes for the first time in history. We were able to do it instantaneously via the web. And we reached you know, this stunning conclusion that we had eight or nine different cultures all predicting some kind of event that was coming and uh, startlingly close, not only in date, but in the nature of the predictions. How is it possible so many diverse cultures throughout the ages appear to have predicted the same year as the end of everything? Perhaps believers of the prophecies are misinterpreting the evidence. Is man able to predict future events at all? We can't predict even a month in advance what's going to happen, or even a week. So it's impossible to say what will happen on a specific date in the future. Others disagree. We have something that the ancients considered to be so important that they put it down in prophecies, they put it down in calendars. Every single disparate culture was trying in every way possible to send a message downstream that something incredible was going to happen. We will examine each prophecy to confirm whether 2012 is perhaps the pivotal year when everything will change forever. Or we may discover that 2012 is no different than any other year. But no examination of the 2012 theory can begin without exploring history's most famous calendar, one that has confounded and fascinated millions since its creation 2,000 years ago, the Mayan calendar. The Maya were a Mesoamerican culture that peaked between the years 250 and 900 AD. 
They had an amazing knowledge of science, art, architecture, astronomy, cosmology. And some people will say it's because they live so close to the land. They observe nature in a way that we no longer need to. We have computers and TV. Why do we need to go out and look at the stars? We don't do that anymore. We are so out of touch with the natural cycles. How did such an ancient culture identify astronomical events so far into the future? The Mayans were very fascinated with astronomical cycles and with time and had constructed many different ways of, of, of sort of being related to time. Awed by the night sky and its constellations, the Mayans searched the stars for omens. Meticulously tracking celestial patterns, they developed an ingenious system of calendars. The calendars were circles of stone, some of which could interlock like the gears of a clock. More than a thousand years ago, in the classical Mayan period, they determined the length of the year, the solar year, to within eight tenths of a second of what we now know it or consider it to be with our computerized technology today. Their calendar, there's actually more than 20 calendars that charted the movements of the sun, the moon, Venus, the cycles of nature and harvest, all sorts of, of things. They, they saw clocks within clocks, cycles within cycles. They are the timekeepers of everything. The most significant of the Mayan calendars was the long count. It tracks a 5,125 year era. Beginning on August 11th, 3114 BC and abruptly ending on December 21st, 2012. Did the Mayans actually intend this date to represent the end of time? Some believe the final date of their calendar simply indicates a reset to a new cycle, a new long count. But others see an alarming trend. An investigation into other cultures across the ages and the continents has also identified December 21st as an especially significant day. It marks the winter solstice in the Northern Hemisphere, the day of the year when the sun appears farthest from the Earth. It happens every year. It's actually the pagan origin of what we now call Christmas. Science has confirmed that the winter solstice in 2012 will coincide with an extraordinarily rare event called a galactic alignment. It will seem to place our sun in the very center of our home galaxy, the Milky Way. The galactic alignment is caused by the alignment of the winter solstice sun with the equatorial plane of the Milky Way. The Milky Way is a massive pinwheel-shaped disk of stars that includes our sun. From our vantage point within it, the Milky Way looks like a band with a dark rift in the center, a place where there are no visible stars. Mayan astronomers calculated that the winter solstice sun appears to line up within this dark rift center of the galaxy once every 26,000 years. How they arrived at this conclusion is a mystery. But they accurately predicted the next galactic alignment thousands of years beyond their own time. The Maya had been for quite a while trying to figure out when this kind of epochal shift event would happen and even which kind of astronomical cycle it was connected with. Astronomers today have concluded that the coming galactic alignment will be the first such occurrence since the beginning of human civilization. But there is no scientific evidence to support that it will result in any celestial catastrophe. Still, some observers speculate that the rare event will coincide with cosmic chaos. They suggest violent solar storms hurling deadly radiation toward Earth a magnetic polar shift, even a complete pole reversal. Scenarios that could leave our planet devastated and billions dead. According to some interpreters, the Mayan calendar is clear. 2012 marks the end of time. But as to the specific horrors mankind could face on that fateful day, the Mayans are ominously silent. 
If we accept that the ancient Mayans were warning future generations of an apocalypse in the year 2012, they may not have been alone. A trail of evidence suggests that other ancient cultures may have arrived at the very same conclusion about a possible end date for the world. Could the same be said of history's most notorious prophet, Nostradamus? Will all of these lines of evidence converge to signal our destruction in 2012? 2012. Many believe that this is the date when the world will end. Some say it is predicted in a 2,000-year-old Mayan calendar. Similar timelines from other cultures seem to point to the exact same date. Is this really a sign that humanity is on the brink of apocalypse? As 2012 approaches, those open to the possibility are examining the different strands of evidence with increased urgency. Their goal is to determine whether these strands are linked with a seemingly escalating number of recent natural disasters. I think the cataclysm is coming straight at us. I think there's nothing we can do about it. It is both an external cataclysm, i.e. outside our planet, and it is an internal cataclysm. We are in very serious trouble, very serious trouble. Others say not so. I think what's happening from a 21st century perspective, we're looking at these prophetic clocks and kind of reading into it what we want to read into it. They're quite vague, and it kind of reminds me of these people that knock on my door and tell me Armageddon's just around the corner. December 26th. 2004, eight years before 2012. An earthquake beneath the Indian Ocean registers 9.3 on the Richter scale, the second largest ever recorded. It propels walls of water as high as 50 feet toward unsuspecting victims in 11 different countries. When the water recedes, entire communities are gone. The death toll is staggering. A quarter million people have perished. Some suggest this tragedy has brought us one step closer to the end of days as we march toward the finality of the Mayan timeline. The Mayans chose December 21st, 2012, the date of the galactic alignment, as the end of their calendar and perhaps the end of the world but they may not have been alone in doing so. You have a lot of indigenous cultures and myth-based cultures which are, seem to be very aware of this as a time of transformation. And other cultures are now stepping forth, saying that they have prophecies around this time. One such culture, the Hopi Indians of the American Southwest, have lived on the land that is now present-day Arizona for nearly a thousand years. Like their Mayan predecessors, they find a union with the earth and the sky, and in them, seek to answer the mysteries of the universe. Centuries ago, they carved their prediction of man's future destruction in stone on what is now known as the Hopi Prophecy Rock. Like the Mayan calendar, the Hopi prophecy breaks down humankind's timeline into phases or worlds. According to interpreters, the Hopi believed that the world has been created and destroyed three times. The first three worlds were wiped out by violent natural forces, volcanoes, a great ice age, and flood. They believe we now inhabit the fourth world. They see this as the cusp between the uh, fourth world and the fifth world. And they have a whole series of oral prophecies that they feel have been uh, fulfilled with only a few left to take place before we enter into this next world. Hopi traditions predict that near the day of the great purification, man will bring home pieces of the moon and there will be cobwebs in the sky through which we travel and communicate, all disrupting a delicate cosmic balance. Are the Hopi predictions of the moon landing, airplane travel, and telecommunications accurate? 
To those seeking confirmation of the Mayan prophecy of 2012, they are indicators that the time remaining for the Hopi's fourth world, our world, is alarmingly short. To some, the imagery of the Hopi prophecy rock suggests we are soon destined to experience a great catastrophe, purged by fire from the sky, possibly solar storms, an asteroid, or nuclear weapons. Thousands of miles away from the Maya and the Hopi, and centuries apart, another culture has its own prophecy of our end. The ancient Hindus created a calendar that some interpreters believe also points at 2012. The mythology of the Hindus, like that of the Maya and Hopi, holds that life in the universe occurs in cycles. According to Hindu myth, each cycle of life is divided into four ages, called yugas, the Dwapara, Treta, Satya, and the Kali. Humankind begins each cycle enlightened by virtue and high ideals. Then, over time, humans degenerate into a state of evil and corruption. The philosophy of life cycles is mirrored in our modern world in the way we keep time. The modern system of time we use on our watches, it's 12 hours of a.m., 12 hours of p.m. for a total of 24 hours. A.m. is an increasing light, p.m. is decreasing light. Our present system of time is a microcosm of the yuga system. According to ancient Hindu texts, we now live in the final age of the Kali Yuga. The texts indicate that this age began in 3102 BC. Intriguingly, this date is separated from the start of the Mayan long count calendar by only 12 years. Could this final age end in 2012 and usher in the end of days, just as the Mayans prophesied with their calendar? The final age of the Kali Yuga, described in the ancient Hindu texts, has been seen by some to bear a striking resemblance to our own time. With its escalating unrest, pestilence, and destruction, they believe humankind is consuming itself until a final cataclysm annihilates everything. Hell before heaven, or the darkness before the dawn. And this is something that's repeated in a lot of mythologies, a lot of creation stories, a lot of cultures. Many interpreters say it's a reach to target 2012 as the point of intersection for the prophecies of the Maya, Hopi, and Hindus. But some believe the correlations shared by these diverse cultures are too striking to be a coincidence. Others suggest yet another prophetic voice has joined the chorus. History's most renowned seer, Nostradamus. The French Renaissance prophet may have also foreseen calamity in 2012, as he may have for other world events. Nostradamus predicted a lot of very notable events from 1555 to the present day. The rise and fall of Napoleon. He predicted the landing on the moon. He predicted the events of World War II, including the rise and fall of Hitler. He's predicted an enormous amount of things. Some believe that the prophecies of Nostradamus point directly at today's perilous times. Could his cryptic quatrains have been describing the cataclysm that some say awaits us in 2012? After a great misery from mankind, and even greater approaches, it will rain blood, milk, famine, iron, and pestilence. In the sky will be seen a fire, dragging a trail of sparks. Apocalyptic visions are everywhere in the work of Nostradamus. The most frightening and familiar image fire in the sky. Is Nostradamus pointing to some yet undiscovered threat from the skies? A comet 
or asteroid hurtling silently through space, deadly solar flares thrown off from the sun. Modern science now searches for answers to these questions. What evidence might astronomers discover to support the voices of those who predict doomsday in 2012? Will the world end in 2012? Or will it slowly keep turning as it has for millions of years? Some interpreters of the Mayan calendar say that the Mayans foresaw 2012 as the year of the apocalypse. And they see corroboration in the prophecies of other ancient cultures, the Hopi and Hindu. But skeptics see few real connections. Now the debate intensifies as some seek answers from history's most renowned seer, Nostradamus. What is his prediction for 2012? The year never appears in any of his quatrains. But some believe one quatrain alludes to an astronomical event that could potentially occur. In the sky will be seen a fire, dragging a trail of sparks. Some researchers believe Nostradamus is describing an asteroid or comet. Over eons, Earth has been struck by a variety of celestial objects, some of which triggered extinction. There is a theory that the dinosaurs 65 million years ago were wiped out by an asteroid if that were to happen, we could be looking at an end of the world scenario, definitely. Something that big were to happen, uh, humanity wouldn't survive. Could an asteroid strike Earth in 2012? NASA estimates there are a total of 20,000 asteroids and comets in our solar system that are potential threats. But scientists know where only 6,000 of these objects are, and some fear one could be heading our way. Analysts at NASA have confirmed that a different threat from space may impact Earth, from our own sun. It just so happens, perhaps coincidentally, that the solar activity, sunstorms, sunspots, and the explosions that emanate from them will climax in 2012. This is not a Mayan or a New Age prediction. This is by consensus of contemporary astronomers. What we know from the past is that there's an 11-year solar cycle, and we'll be coming to the peak of that solar cycle in 2012. So the chances of solar activity being high, of disturbances coming from the sun, will be high for the whole year of 2012. It's a paradox but we're more susceptible to problems from the sun now than we ever have been before. And that's because we rely on increasingly sophisticated technology, microcircuits, microchips, small things that can easily be disrupted by just a small amount of radiation. If the solar climax of 2012 is more powerful than any previously recorded, what could be the worst case scenario? Without any warning, we suddenly have a communication blackout over the polar caps. We lose contact with our aircraft flying from the eastern United States to East Asia. The next thing that happens is a big cloud of solar plasma, that means charged ions and electrons, slams into the Earth, compresses the Earth's magnetic field, and sets off a storm inside the Earth's magnetic field. Satellites crippled, communication cut off, all electricity out. Chaos ensues as our electronic world shuts down. Could this be our imminent future? Or will our weakening magnetic field protect us as it always has in the past? Prophecies foretelling the world's end in 2012 have emerged not only from the cosmos, but also the inner mind. An American shaman of sorts would embark on a different type of cosmic journey in the 1970s. This hero of the counterculture searched for answers to the human condition. 
His name, Terence McKenna. He would combine complex mathematics, Chinese philosophy, and psychedelic drugs into a provocative new form of prophecy. His quest eventually led him to conclude that, just as the Mayans predicted over a thousand years earlier, humanity's end was destined for 2012. In 1971, McKenna and his brother Dennis accelerated their spiritual experiment with a trip through the Colombian Amazon. The result was an end of days theory so novel, scholars took immediate notice. We were, I guess, children of the 60s in a sense, and part of the counterculture. We were interested in alchemy, magic, psychedelics, and many subjects that you might think of as esoteric. The McKenna brothers went to Colombia in search of ukuhe, a hallucinogenic potion that contains DMT, a psychedelic drug. We found out that DMT occurred in many plants and that many of these plants were used in shamanism, particularly in South American shamanism. It actually opened the doorway to what seemed to be a profoundly different world and a, a different world in the sense that it seemed as real as this world. We thought that we were really on, on a quest for some kind of holy grail. Use of these recreational drugs would lead to Terence McKenna's groundbreaking life's work, time wave theory. This theory proposes that the ebb and flow of significant events in the universe is an inherent quality of time, and that across the millennia, these significant events increase exponentially until they climax in 2012. Skeptics consider it pseudo-scientific fantasy. Followers of the time wave theory believe it's genius. The idea for the time wave grew out of this experiment what you might call ideas downloaded from another dimension. But not everyone agrees. What skeptics would consider a psychedelic drug trip for kicks, the McKenna brothers saw as an experiment probing untapped human potential. A number of other things did manifest, which you might interpret as paranormal. For instance, we seem to have telepathy uh, with each other. I could hear what Terence was saying in my head and vice versa. We seem to have access to a huge database of information from somewhere. I was traveling backward in time. He was traveling forward in time. And Terence did not sleep for 14 days after the experiment. Terence McKenna believed that during the experiment, a divine voice instructed him to analyze numerical patterns of an ancient Chinese text called the I Ching, a text that uses complex symbols to organize seemingly random events, including those yet to happen. This system, still in use today, is believed by some to predict the future. The I Ching is a Chinese divination system that uses broken and unbroken lines in hexagrams to form patterns. There are 64 sequences that you can get, 64 combinations. Now, Terence and Dennis, they saw a pattern emerge that correlated with events of novelty, which are just simply new events that happen to human beings or that happen in the world or in the universe. And he started making charts and almost like automatic writing, running, looking at the I Ching and running these cycles of 64 hexagrams in the I Ching and six times 64 is 384. Well, it turns out 384 is a perfect 13 month lunar uh, year. Guided by the I Ching, Terence McKenna used complex math to plot so-called periods of novelty on a wave or timeline. He then looked for a significant date in history, which would mark the start of the final cycle of life on Earth. He chose August 8, 1945. 
the date of the atomic bombing of Hiroshima, Japan. To that date in 1945, he added 67.29 years, the length of one cycle of life, according to the I Ching. The result was an end date in December 2012, essentially the same end date identified by the Mayans. For McKenna, it was the missing key that unlocked the mystery of his time wave theory. But Terence McKenna would never learn whether his doomsday time wave theory would be realized. He died in April of 2000. We really need Terence now. We need his eloquence, and we don't have it. And I'm an extremely poor substitute for it. But I feel that I have to at least bring Terence's work to the forefront because it is the most incredibly important work that I've ever seen. For some, Terence McKenna's work suggests that the I Ching is yet another ancient prophecy corroborating doom for 2012. And some believe a different 21st century prophet, one hidden in the shadows, has issued the same dire warning. It is not rooted in ancient wisdom nor long lost cultures, but microchips. Could history's ultimate source of information, the internet, hold the secret to what might happen in 2012? The Mayans, the Hopi, the Hindu, the I Ching, modern science. Adherents to the belief that the world will end in 2012 say these cultures are sending a message of warning to our generation. They believe more proof of this is perhaps unfolding today. October 2008, New York City, financial capital of the world. The US economy plummets into a free-falling state of chaos, sending shockwaves across all global markets. Major financial institutions close their doors. Food and fuel prices skyrocket. Unemployment in the U.S. rises to the greatest levels since World War II, a major disruption just four years before 2012. Could the recent financial collapse be simply the inherent nature of capitalism at work, or is the world moving closer to an end of days cataclysm? The global economy is collapsing, people are panicking, we are living in a very fear-based time right now. I think what we have here with 2012 is what I call chicken littleism. The sky is falling, the sky is falling. What date? Oh, it must be now. Some believe the debate over 2012 can be settled by a newer oracle now among us, a revolutionary triumph of the computer age. In 1997, a mysterious former computer consultant, today known only as Cliff, created a program called WebBot. Those familiar with WebBot and its inventor say Cliff designed the program to predict future stock market trends. The WebBot program is really interesting because it corresponds with a Hopi prophecy that towards the end time, the world would become like a spider web and everybody would be able to communicate interconnected by this web. Well, we've got the World Wide Web now. The Internet's powerful ability to disseminate and build upon vast amounts of global information has led some to a provocative belief that the Internet is a repository of our own psychic visions of the future. WebBot is our tool to decoding it. The WebBot project is looking to tap into the collective unconscious of humanity by focusing on specific search words and keywords to kind of look for tipping points, trends, mems, uh, paradigms that are being discussed on the internet. WebBot is a software application that automatically combs internet data in search of keywords denoting trends. It not only finds the keywords, but those surrounding them and analyzes the results using linguistic tools. The data ends up at a central collection point, its location and data collectors still unknown, where they can be read and interpreted. 
Results emerge as mysterious clipped fragments, reminiscent of the poem-like quatrains of history's most famous seer, Nostradamus. In the 1990s, WebBot completed countless word searches and compiled trend reports. And in 2001, an unexpected pattern seemed to emerge. I first heard about it in June of 2001 when one of my friends sent me an email saying some crackpot is saying uh, that there's going to be something happening in late summer, high-rise buildings are going to be destroyed, airplanes, terrorism, many die. And I went, yeah, right, whatever, you know, and I ignored it. And 911 happened. A few years later, I got another message from my friend saying that crazy guy is saying something again. I said, what's he saying now? And he's saying, southern city, flood, many die. And I said, OK, if anything happened, I would now start paying attention to this guy. Well, Katrina happened three weeks later in New Orleans. Hurricane Katrina barreled into the southern coast of the United States on August 29, 2005 causing catastrophic floods and levee failures throughout 80% of the city of New Orleans. Nearly 2,000 people lost their lives. Property damage surpassed $100 billion. Those using WebBot as a predictive device began forecasting more trends, many of which supposedly point to a dark and dangerous future. The 2008 stock market crash, bank failures, mass unemployment, collapse of the housing market. According to some, WebBot saw it all coming, based on information in cyberspace. As for 2012, some believe WebBot purportedly foresees countless casualties resulting from an unusual combination of disease, economic collapse, and even an unidentified threat from space, echoing the Hopi Indians and the 500-year-old prophecies of Nostradamus. But skeptics say cyberspace has no mysterious ability to predict the future. If we do accept the forecasts of WebBot followers and believers in the 2012 apocalypse as accurate, then a major question looms. What will happen on December 22nd, 2012, the day after? Is it possible for anyone to survive, let alone rebuild? A doomsday bunker on the edge of the Earth containing one of our most precious commodities could be our best hope. December 21st, 2012, a date predicted thousands of years ago across diverse cultures to be the end of everything. When the world will lie smoldering in ruins, decimated by a final cataclysm. Some believe solar storms will rain destruction upon our planet. Power will shut down, and even a new ice age may emerge. If we accept the premise that life as we know it will draw to a close, what might await in 2013? It will be very, very hard to survive this, because all the volcanoes that will go off, they will give cloud of dust around the earth and that will stay there for at least 30 to 40 years so there will be almost no sun the stone age was better because you had sun and after this cataclysm you won't have food you won't have sun you won't have electricity you will have nothing this is the aftermath of global disaster a tiny fraction of the population has survived and must now claw for what little resources remain. The only people that are going to survive the cataclysm are those who are taking precautions now. For survivors to endure,
they will have had to stockpile food, weapons, and supplies necessary to live on and rebuild. I think that the only safety that people are going to find is in community and in networks of trust. Trust is going to become like a new form of value principle to replace the vanished obsession with money. Researchers suggest the safest possible locations to resettle after the devastation will be far away from cities, coastlines, nuclear plants, and at least 6,000 feet in elevation. We have found several places that we think that are okay. Malawi is okay, uh, Morocco is okay, Ethiopia if you stay far away from the volcanoes, and also Madagascar. But why so high above sea level? The pollution that is gonna be created by the tidal waves, it's gonna be taking out industry, densely populated areas. We're gonna have oil wells, tank farms, tankers, chemical plants that are gonna be inundated, and the Farmlands are going to be inundated with salty, toxic water. This is why higher elevations are going to be needed to habitate and colonize and be able to plant crops out of the flood zone. Those who believe that hoarding supplies and choosing the right location are not enough to survive now look to a bold new model. 300 miles north of the Norwegian mainland, 427 feet inside a frozen mountain, lies a bunker unlike any other. One of the more positive things that's being done in case there is a series of global catastrophes in 2012 is the Doomsday Seed Vault, which is an impenetrable vault that is storing seeds for us. It is supposedly immune to everything from a supervolcanic eruption to nuclear explosion. And in this vault, Geneticists, researchers, scientists are bringing the best quality seeds that they can in the hopes that if something ever did happen, we would be able to use these seeds to repopulate these plants, to have a new agricultural society. The Savalbard Global Seed Vault began operation in 2008. It's the world's $9 million insurance policy against catastrophic loss of plants on Earth. It can hold up to 4.5 million distinct samples of seeds, or about 2 billion in total. The seeds are gathered from all over the world, encompassing almost every variety of the globe's most important food crops. The seed vault is basically a, a little Noah's Ark. The refrigerated vaults preserve the seeds at zero degrees Fahrenheit. If the refrigeration units fail, the Arctic permafrost surrounding the vault will still keep the seeds frozen at 25 degrees Fahrenheit. To sabotage or steal from this facility, one would have to brave bone-chilling temperatures, polar bears, and state-of-the-art security. Assuming survivors of an apocalypse could reach the seed vault, the seeds stored here would ensure that they could regrow the crops needed for survival but not everyone is convinced the facility is a fail-safe against 2012. The tidal wave from two kilometer high comes in, everything will be destroyed, nothing will be left, and it won't help us to restart civilization. So, according to me, it's a huge waste of money. But as 2012 approaches, many believe the focus on this date as a year of apocalypse is a result of misinterpretation and hysteria. Others contend that a chorus of ancient prophecies have manifested in today's events and are clear signs of impending calamity. For them, it is no coincidence that one message of doom is seemingly shared by cultures separated by so many miles and centuries. They're feeling it, they're seeing it in the news. Something is coming. The year 2012 appears to me as a completely arbitrary date. Um, no different from 2011 or 2013. Um, I'm sure there will be some exciting things happen in that year, but then that's true for all other years as well. 
What I'm most worried about for 2012 is the domino effect. It's global systemic collapse. The clock keeps ticking as we await the arrival of December 21st, 2012. There is every reason to believe that day will dawn as so many millions have before it. But what the world will look like on the morning after, December 22nd, is anyone's guess. The waters rise. The banks are breached. Men and women are swept away as a great flood of biblical proportions inundates everything. The deluge comes without warning. Or does it? A painting, a sketch, a poem. These are clues that may promise total annihilation. For thousands of years, prophets around the world have predicted the end of days. More than one suggests the apocalypse is fast approaching. We call this theoretical convergence between doomsday prophecies and today's events the Nostradamus effect. Water. Our planet is almost completely covered by this precious resource. Without it, man cannot survive. But Leonardo da Vinci, master painter, scientist, and engineer, was obsessed with it. He could see that at the end of the day, if nature decided to do something big, we could do nothing about it. It's not surprising that one would hope for an end of days, a last time, something where good would defeat bad. New evidence suggests that Leonardo foretold of an enormous deluge that will flood the world and destroy mankind. His warnings may be hidden in codes and symbols that secretly permeate his masterpieces. We will investigate the belief by some that today's increasingly violent hurricanes, tornadoes, and earthquakes are signs that coincide with his warnings of a coming global catastrophe. We will neither refute nor endorse these theories, merely present the evidence. Leonardo's belief in the awesome power of the natural world, especially water, influenced his engineering feats, fueled his intellectual pursuits, and colored his art. Some believe it may have also triggered apocalyptic prophecies. Circa 1482, Leonardo wrote, Rafts and other contrivances on which were jumbled men, women, and children, terrified by the fury of the winds, which rolled the waters over, under, and around the corpses of the drowned. The words are very powerful, they're very vivid. They are a warning. There's no doubt that Leonardo had an apocalyptic frame of mind, and he wasn't alone in that. At the time he was painting, there were widespread fears of an apocalyptic event about to occur, to the point where people expected some kind of vast deluge. Those who follow Leonardo suggest there is a symbolic code in his works. Was this master painter a forerunner to his fellow prophet, Michel de Nostradamus? Was Leonardo secretly warning future generations of their fate? I think he had always felt himself to be in a process of discovery. He had not reached any clear conclusions about things, and so uh, was hesitant to perhaps talk about these things to, to others. Clues to Leonardo's cryptic visions may be found by examining more closely the dark era in which he lived in Italy. During Leonardo's age, the 15th and 16th centuries, belief in horrific images of the world's end, as described in the Book of Revelation, had intensified throughout Western Europe. 
Leonardo on the years either side of 1500 is living in one of the most extraordinary times in European history. Enormous turbulence. Europe was emerging from the Dark Ages into the light of exploration and discovery. And the all-powerful Catholic Church was just beginning to feel the first inklings of the Protestant Reformation that would split Christianity in the West. These tumultuous times surely affected and influenced Leonardo, where even the power of nature presented a formidable threat and danger. Florence, Italy, 1466. A young Leonardo da Vinci witnesses a massive flood of the Arno River. Did he possibly see crops washed away? Buildings destroyed? Bloated bodies floating in the waters? It may have been that early experience. Perhaps it kind of left him fascinated by this idea of what water can do. A normally passive river suddenly rises up over its banks and uh, floods the city and causing destruction. Leonardo would develop a lifelong fascination with water. Researchers conclude that the Arno flooding may have been the cause. The raw power of nature may have also taught Leonardo about the dynamics of water erosion and flow velocity. In the years to follow, he searched for clues to harness the immense power of water and at the same time documented his fear of its destructive force. Some interpreters of Leonardo's work suspect these little known passages in his private journals are warnings of environmental catastrophe for our time. All the waters dashing on their shores seem to be battling them with the blows of drowned bodies. Did Leonardo see in nature's terrible, unrelenting power a clue to man's destiny? Did he foresee the modern world destroyed by a flood? Much like the biblical flood that wiped away the sins of mankind in the book of Genesis. I will send rain upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights, and every living thing that I have made I will blot out from the face of the ground. This vivid prophecy from the Old Testament is echoed across time and in other cultures. The Epic of Gilgamesh from Babylon also refers to an apocalyptic deluge that destroys mankind. A mythic Chinese emperor founded the first dynasty only after he was able to divert floodwaters that reached to the heavens. Hopi tradition speaks of a devastating torrent that wipes out a corrupt people. Interpreters of prophecy suggest that all of these floods mirror environmental catastrophe taking place around the world today. The only question, then and now, is how much time do they believe we have to heed the warning? Leonardo's most famous creations, including The Last Supper, and the Mona Lisa, each filled with intricate complexity and symbolism, suggest he knew and hid the answer. The thing about Leonardo, when you step into his work as an artist, you're stepping into a very problematic world. With every Leonardo painting, everything that he does, it's never clear. Leonardo appears to use symbolic images in his paintings to communicate multiple ideas. There are some drawings where the people's hair seems to be like a storm. You know, it's just an extraordinary vortex of, of turbulent curls. It becomes a, a kind of trait of Leonardo. We don't really know what Leonardo's reason was for including that kind of detail. And I suppose this keeps art historians, at the very least, busy. Was Leonardo leaving statements that foretell the exact manner in which the world will end? wiped out by rising sea levels and geologic upheaval? He wrote, Seawater will rise above the high peaks of mountains towards the sky and will fall down again onto the dwellings of men. 
Leonardo called these writings his riddles. Today, many call them his prophecies. All round may be seen venerable trees, uprooted and stripped by the fury of the winds. The swollen rivers overflow and submerge the wide lowlands and their inhabitants. What might Leonardo's prophecies reveal? And why did he go to great lengths to disguise so many of his beliefs in his work? To understand his doomsday prophecy, we must first take a closer look at Leonardo da Vinci, the man. If you wanted to reconstruct the figure of Leonardo nowadays, you would need probably 20 of what we call scientists. And then on top of that, a wonderful artist, a wonderful painter, the combination of all these would make a Leonardo. His great gift was one of observation on the one hand and of representation on the other hand. That is to say, he could see things with a depth and in a detail that other people couldn't. But being inquisitive, creative, and willful at this time in Italy, with an authoritative and powerful Catholic Church was considered sacrilege, even unsafe. And Leonardo was smart enough to know it. I'm sure that it was very difficult to progress where an authoritative church and authoritative society was attempting to impose rules and dogmas that don't go in hand in hand with scientific inquiry and personal experience. To keep his writings secret from prying authorities, Leonardo wrote his journals in cryptic, backwards handwriting that could only be deciphered with a mirror. He could do almost anything with his hands, so that was easy for him to do. But obviously, if he wrote them that way, nobody was meant to read them but him. This seemed the only way Leonardo could explore his passion for science and engineering. With 16th century Italy a virtual battlefield, he found creative opportunities in designing weapons of war. Would Leonardo be able to harness the power of water and turn it against his enemies? Does a secret 500-year-old prophecy warn that our modern world will be destroyed by a great flood? And is the prophet someone unexpected? Not the notorious seer Nostradamus, but painter and engineer Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo lived in very turbulent times. It's hardly surprising that he also had a very apocalyptic attitude. Leonardo's life's work seems to point to floods in hidden codes and symbols. Researchers say these symbols may be converging with earlier visions of deluge prophecy from other cultures. Did Leonardo envision that the melting of today's polar ice caps, 500 years before global warming, would become a major threat? Is this convergence proof of the Nostradamus effect, a theory suggesting that past prophecy is colliding with today's cataclysms to usher in the end of everything? To his followers, Leonardo was keenly aware of the power and peril inherent in nature. He was observing with interest where that balance wasn't kept in the right sort of proportion, and where things got out of balance, where he observed and wrote about the disasters and what was likely to happen if that balance wasn't kept. Leonardo's secretive nature, combined with his curiosity, may have prompted him to take a closer look at his own and mankind's dark side. He was not that interested in human nature per se. He was interested in human character and personality as it was exhibited through behavior. I think Leonardo instead was interested in nature, nature, if you like. Leonardo's reputation as a gifted engineer grew while he was living in Milan in 1485. Soon he was designing groundbreaking weapons, killing machines that, if constructed, would have given his patrons a distinct advantage during an exceptionally violent era. 
Italy was less a country and more a mix of city-states, each with its own enemies. Clashes and small wars were a constant. So it's absolutely chaos and instability. Leonardo would have seen death all around him much more frequently than, than we do, just as a natural course of things. He was paid good money by his employers to make war machines and also to design fortifications. The roles of these weapons intrigued him, and his fascination with controlling natural forces grew as a result. A flying machine that would conquer the sky, a submarine that would defy the ocean depths. Leonardo was among the first to imagine many of the weapons we use today to annihilate one another. It's like nuclear age in a way. People thought, well, we could actually destroy the world. Some researchers believe he saw these attempts at dominating nature as a way to combat his fear of its destructive power, even its ultimate devastation of mankind. He was a great visionary and futurist. The idea of engineering and technology and invention, I mean, we take that for granted, but those ideas didn't exist. Did Leonardo use his apocalyptic visions of a deluge to inspire his most destructive weapons of war? While living in Florence, Leonardo proposed putting his knowledge of hydrodynamics to good use. He suggested diverting the Arno River, the very same river that had overflowed in his youth, away from rival city Pisa. He writes, Huge lifeless bodies will be seen to bear multitudes of men forcibly to the destruction of their lives. Da Vinci did have the idea that we could draw lessons from nature and apply them to machines and then make them that much more powerful. He knew about canals, he knew about how to manage water. He did so for um, civic purposes, but he also used it for military purposes. Perhaps influenced by the times, his own war machines, and haunted by visions of drowning and natural disaster, Leonardo described catastrophes that prophesied mankind's doom. The swollen waters gyrate in the lake that contains them, and with eddying vortices percussively strike diverse objects and leap into the air with muddy spume. Leonardo described it vividly, visually. The description of and the warning of what happens to what may happen to humanity if humanity does not respect um, the prime mover. All round may be seen venerable trees uprooted and stripped by the fury of the winds. Leonardo's prophecies, most of them, are written in the 1490s. They're like riddles. You know, you would prophesy something that was going to happen, and then at the end, the punchline would kind of prick the bubble, as it were. The great artist often recited these riddles in public for his rich sponsor, the Duke of Milan. They were intended as a form of entertainment, but Leonardo's cryptic prophecies actually startled and frightened his listeners. Little children will be taken from the arms of their mothers and thrown to the ground and then torn to pieces. They're literary productions, but they're not devoid of real passion. When he tells about prophecies about destruction brought by weapons, um, they're clearly felt. The mournful shouts will be heard, tortured and despoiled and left at the end naked and motionless. What might have been Leonardo's true motive in telling these riddles? There's always a sense of reasoning in Leonardo's prophecies, and there's also often a moral and ethical reading to them, even if he himself explained that the prophecies could be described as brain teasers, almost as if he, the author of them, was a madman. It will seem to men that they see strange destruction in the sky. It will look as though flames fly up into the sky and flee in terror down from it. There remains in Leonardo the concept of violence, which could be the explosion of nature. And in the cosmos, he is conscious of the energies that could be incited to cause ruin. 
whatever Leonardo's expectations of man causing his own demise, his interpreters say he believed that a cataclysmic end of the world was certain, that our annihilation would come by the same force that created the Earth, and it would destroy mankind. The concept of balance was fundamental for Leonardo. The balance between forces, energies, situations, elements which comprise the surrounding world. When this balance is broken, there is a risk of devastation. The explanation of this belief may be secretly encoded within Leonardo's art. Leonardo had this interesting attitude towards the natural world. He felt that it was in a sense, pent-up power, which was at any moment liable to burst and destroy everything utterly. The record of Leonardo's life suggests that he could not repress these apocalyptic visions, but they manifested in his work. What, if anything, is embedded in the Mona Lisa, arguably the greatest painting of all time? And could it predict our demise? And what of his other seminal work, St. John the Baptist? Will Leonardo's masterworks actually unlock the riddles contained within his doomsday prophecy? Leonardo da Vinci may have been haunted since his youth by recurring images of natural disaster and man's inhumanity to man. Some believe he expressed his fears in seemingly prophetic writings that told of a coming watery apocalypse. He wrote, and fragments of mountains already scoured bare by the torrents, falling into those torrents and choking their valleys until the swollen rivers overflow and submerge the wide lowlands and their inhabitants. These profound warnings of natural disaster flooded his art. Leonardo is interested in big destruction. Uh, it fascinates him and, and appalls him at the same time. Was he trying to communicate to us in the 21st century? even as he obscured his message behind symbols and allegory? Some believers of prophecy cite the frequency of violent storms like Hurricane Katrina and earthquakes such as the one off the coast of Sumatra in 2004 as proof that Leonardo's warnings are now coming true. In Leonardo's early paintings, experts point to his use of deformity and grotesque human shapes. To them, this perhaps foreshadows his fear of the power of nature to destroy mankind. Clearly, Leonardo was exploiting his deep and expanding knowledge of anatomy through cutting up dead bodies acquired by potentially sacrilegious activity. Dissecting cadavers would have connected him with death. He would have been sort of familiar with its forms. He would have seen death at an early age too, more aware of death than perhaps we are these days, but I think he was interested in it again from a, shall we say, a scientific point of view. Leonardo's morbid fascination with death encouraged him to search within the bodies of the dead for clues, clues to the very nature of death itself. Bodies without souls will, with their judgments, give us rules teaching us how to die well. In his work, he was driven by an obsessive quest for knowledge about the very basis of life and death. Leonardo would perform secret autopsies, attempting to make deeper connections between the physical forces of nature and man's place in it. Leonardo was interested in discovering the root of things, where things actually originated from. He looked inside the human body, literally. He dissected the human body and opened the head. It really started the idea of reverse engineering the human body, not just to look inside and see what was there, but actually try to figure out how it worked and then use that, these biologically inspired paradigms, as inspiration to create machines and technology. But Leonardo had to exercise extreme discretion. In his day, human dissection was considered wrong and in some instances, illegal. Taking a body to pieces according to the church was not acceptable as the Catholic Church believed that our body would then exist after life and imagining having a body fragmented in the afterlife was not something that was acceptable. 
Judging by the fine precision of his drawings, Leonardo devoted long hours to this bloody pursuit. He would dissect fetuses in the wombs of dead mothers, carving up old bodies until he would become exhausted. What might have been Leonardo's ultimate goal? Was he searching for the convergence of man and nature, two forces in harmony rather than at odds? Leonardo had a global view of the world. The world outside us wasn't separated from what went on inside our bodies. And in fact, it was incredibly useful for him as he observed nature very carefully to make comparisons and analogies between what went on in the body of the earth, as he called it, and what went on in the body of man. To Leonardo, just as the human body was made up of flesh and bones, veins and blood, so was the earth made of soil, rock, rivers and water. And he saw the circulation inside the human body and compared that to the circulation of the water inside the body of the earth. Did he conclude that just as the spilling of blood could kill the body of a man, so could the flow of tidal waves and extreme weather destroy our living earth? He wrote, He who will give us nourishment and light will come down in a rush from the sky. And so to convey and yet hide these beliefs, Leonardo encoded everything he knew into his paintings. Through composition, texture, style, color, even brush strokes, the fate of humanity was sealed in his canvases. I think he, along with probably everyone else living at the time, couldn't possibly imagine a situation where peace reigned. And from that perspective, you would be desperately looking for some final end to this chaos. Haunted by this knowledge, he was compelled to reproduce the Earth's chaotic nature in his art. For example, in Leonardo's Last Supper, in the background there are three openings, three windows, and the number three can serve symbolically or symbolical reference to the Trinity and so on, with Christ, the head of Jesus, actually in the painting, filling the middle window. And so that's functioning symbolically in, in that fashion. As to whether there are hidden ones, they must be hidden for good reason. Leonardo produced three paintings in particular that were so important to him, he kept them nearby until the end of his life. Mona Lisa, the Virgin and Child with Saint Anne, and Saint John the Baptist. What clues to Leonardo's vision of apocalypse are concealed in each of these celebrated paintings? These are deeply philosophical paintings. He'd always been interested in painting as more than painting, as conveying knowledge and understanding. Mona Lisa, in a sense, looks like a simple picture, but we forget how staggeringly revolutionary this is. First of all, she looks at us, which is very daring for a woman, and she reacts, she smiles. So you're almost bound to say, what is this person thinking about? The mountains on the left look unstable, they're being undermined. There are rivers at work, there's a high lake and a low lake. And at some point that high lake is going to break through and it's going to cascade through the landscape, so it may be flooded. The coming floodwaters are visualized in the swirling locks of her hair and the folds of her gown, a characteristic Leonardo repeated throughout his artwork geologic upheaval threatens to surge right over Mona Lisa. One wonders, you know, what is that doing there? Art historians tend to interpret it as perhaps Leonardo's way of bringing out some other aspect of Mona Lisa, the sitter's character, but um, that's only our attempt to explain why it's there in the first place. Were these religious allegories, as some believe, Hidden clues, warning of coming disaster? Not everyone agrees, but another painting, The Virgin and Child with St. Anne, seems to push similar calamitous ideas further. There are related themes being explored. Now, St. Anne in The Virgin Child and St. Anne is like St. John, she knows the mysteries. 
The child is embracing the lamb, which is sacrifice. It's a sacrificial animal, therefore it prefigures Christ's sacrifice on behalf of mankind. So she is supervising this little spiritual drama. This little spiritual drama, mankind's salvation, is also sitting perilously close to the edge of a cliff. Leonardo is perhaps depicting mankind teetering at the brink of annihilation. But there's more. His final painting of St. John the Baptist makes good use of the swirling whirlpool curls that had become a virtual trademark. Surrounded by darkness, St. John's long hair tumbles down, engulfing him in what could be torrents of raging water. Whenever Leonardo looked at phenomena, he always thought of something else. So when he looks at water, he thinks of hair curling or vice versa. And this appears repeatedly. Finally, St. John's upraised finger may point to the only way out. St. John, of course, is the person who announces that one is to come, the supreme spiritual false being is going to be represented by Christ on earth. He's smiling at you and he's saying, something is to come inexplicable and amazing. Has Leonardo hidden in his final three paintings his own definition of the Trinity? A depiction of the creation, natural balance, and the destruction of the world. Did he perhaps foresee our modern dilemma, where humanity itself appears headed for disaster? Not everyone agrees. He was almost a director who imagined an apocalyptic end of the world. And so he was drawn to the extremely artistic vision for that. They are dealing with aspects of Leonardo's vision about how we understand the world, and how we know there is a force outside the world, even if we don't know really what it is. In the latter years of his life, perhaps still haunted by frightful visions of man's extinction, Leonardo began his great apocalyptic finale, a series of drawings ominously titled The Deluge. These dire illustrations depict tumultuous waves, gales, thunderstorms, and great floods washing away the world. He had an enormous respect for nature's force. And of course, in the era of tsunamis and so on, this is exactly what we're still reminded of, that for all our hubris and thinking we are masters of the world or masters of the universe, we are not. Leonardo's visions mirror one of the Bible's most contentious texts, the Book of Revelation. And there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the whole moon became as blood and the stars of the heavens fell unto the earth. Together with desperate warnings written in his journals, Leonardo perhaps embedded his final somber prophecy of global destruction in the deluge. What encrypted messages might lie within these images to reflect a final deluge to come? Leonardo da Vinci's prophecies seem to predict a horrible deluge wiping out mankind. Is it coincidence that they reflect the natural disasters today that scientists fear will intensify over the next 40 years? How is it possible that Leonardo predicted today's rising waters, a byproduct of our global warming? For interpreters of his work, Leonardo's obsession with watery destruction, as evidenced in his most acclaimed paintings, takes on sinister significance. His series of drawings entitled The Deluge appear strangely prophetic in their visions of the end of days. Circa 1482, Leonardo wrote, The highest mountains, although they are far from the seashores, will drive the sea out of its place. The reason why Leonardo created his final deluge drawings has remained a mystery for over 400 years. They were not sketches to prepare for a painting or any other known purpose. 
Were these images of waterborne disaster his final warning to the world he would leave behind and we would eventually inhabit? Leonardo's ideas, I think, come from thinking about the Christian tradition and the deluge, the biblical deluge, which apparently flooded the whole earth. Some suggest that after years confronted with man's diabolic nature, his brutality and savage instincts, Leonardo foresaw God's judgment coming in the form of a flood, one much like the flood described in the Bible that punished man's sins during Noah's time. Leonardo represented in the flood images something both physical and something extremely symbolic, an unpredictable despair. The drawings are absolute. He used black on black, lost the colors, and accentuated this extreme vision. Earlier in life, Leonardo was aware of the biblical Great Flood. According to the Bible, only Noah, his family, and their ark full of animals survived this deluge that covered the entire planet. Land reappeared very slowly above the waves. To comprehend the idea of oceans high enough to cover mountains, Leonardo conjured up what scientists today call the theory of plate tectonics. Leonardo's chief evidence for the age of the Earth were what we would call fossils. He could see that there were strata on high lands, on mountains, fossils of uh, marine creatures, particularly shells, of course, which is what was preserved. In the 16th century, it was popular belief that the rising oceans of the great biblical flood carried these fossils to the mountaintops. Leonardo rejected that idea. He believed the Earth was much older and more volatile than anyone imagined. He said there's evidence that there must have been multiple big changes, multiple deluges, multiple liftings, multiple collapses in the body of the Earth to give this array of things. Leonardo wrote, All the elements will be seen mixed together with a great disturbance, running now to the center of the Earth, now to the sky, sometimes from east to west, and similarly from this hemisphere to the other. So he could see this vast bending and collapsing and rising of the Earth. It's not exactly plate tectonics in the, in the modern system, but what he shared with the modern vision is the fact that vast, vast movements are occurring. These are not local, they're global. In his deluge sketches, the great visionary depicted gale force winds sweeping away armies, tidal waves washing away navies, torrents pouring down on whole cities, a world unraveling with earthquakes and oceanic displacement. The elements, far from being in their stable position, are as unstable as they could be. You've even got rocks in the air in an extraordinary apocalyptic way. So this is the elements at their most extreme. Human beings are very, very small. They're almost non-existent in comparison with the forces of nature. Though these images are terrifying in their own right, they become even more grisly in the light of Leonardo's writings. All the waters dashing on their shore seem to be battling them with the blows of drowned bodies. Leonardo's warnings on what might happen to the world and to human beings if they didn't respect the balance of the elements was enforced both by his very effective words and the visual rendering of the deluge. It's enough to look at the drawings in detail and just almost scan over the various details and read Leonardo's words and his prophecies. Certainly, these are the fruits of a final meditation, these images of the deluge. Many fear this cycle of destruction by the forces of nature is dramatically increasing in our time. They regard Leonardo's deluge as images of our future. Are melting ice caps and global warming once again raising the level of ocean waters, just as Leonardo da Vinci's drawings depicted?
Some believe Leonardo da Vinci was a genius prophet, warning our generation of a massive flood-like catastrophe. According to them, a close examination of his apocalyptic deluge reveals he accurately predicted disaster in our present age. These intense works were the last Leonardo completed, his final legacy. Should we accept this theory? Are these drawings proof of yet another convergence? One last clue that points to our current environmental crisis. Is this an example of the Nostradamus effect? You see the whole world of Leonardo that comes together, typically at the end of his life, so that the prophecy, in a way, is the realization of what he had been observing since his childhood. He wrote, Among irremediable and destructive terrors, the inundations caused by rivers in flood should certainly be set before every other dreadful and terrifying movement. Every year, warnings by scientists of the consequences of global warming and geologic upheaval grow more dire. Sea levels have increased by one inch over the last 10 years, and they are expected to grow by three feet over the next century. Yet the Earth continues to deteriorate. The Atlantic Ocean is spawning hurricanes with increasing violence and frequency. And in the Pacific, the deadliest tsunamis on record have flooded vast areas. Scientists are increasingly concerned that this worldwide inundation will become much worse. But most are at a loss to fully understand why. The mud will be so deep that men will walk above the trees in their villages. If you think of a man who was searching obsessionally about how nature worked, what made things move, what made things die, what made things uh, begin and end, it's understandable that he might be, at the end of his life, thinking about the end of what he had looked at in the beginning. Interpreters say Leonardo's last works point to the two paths open to humanity. His final painting, John the Baptist, offers hope amid a watery deluge, hinted at in the saint's hair and robes. The saint smiles with proud wisdom and points to heaven, showing the path to God and salvation. But Leonardo's final deluge sketches show the exact opposite. A world out of balance, nature in chaos, and our entire planet possibly under the threat of another great biblical flood. The mournful shouts will be heard, and the loud cries, the hoarse and feeble voices of those who will be tortured and despoiled and left at the end naked and motionless. Crippled by a stroke in his final days, the elderly Leonardo became a melancholy figure, plagued by violent visions of the future. He attempted to organize and pass down his life's work, but a great deal became scattered and sold. Much of his art and writing disappeared and is still missing today. Perhaps more prophecies of Leonardo da Vinci are awaiting discovery. A majority of Leonardo's inventions have been realized in the 500 years since his death. But what of his visions of a global deluge? What would the master think of the extreme instability of our world today? Cities of Africa, your children will be seen to be torn apart in their own homes. What would he think about our recent economic collapse? Invisible coins will lead to the triumph of many who spend them. 
and perhaps the death of mankind. Innumerable lives will be extinguished, and innumerable holes will be made over the earth. I think that the darkness of it is an intensity that he had, which we should respect. We should always think about what begins and what ends and how it ends. Leonardo da Vinci was a visionary. Hindsight today proves that he was amazingly perceptive. Will we change our ways? Or is humanity now hurtling toward a horrific end of days? Exactly as Leonardo depicted.